11. If Zail had told Kentril that Diablo himself resided in the palace where Atana lives, the veteran soldier could not have been more horrified. Gregus Mazzi, the man who had cursed the kingdom and lusted after the Khan's daughter, not only lived, but lurked near enough to do her harm. Never in his life had Kentril wanted so much to slay a person, not even after so many campaigns. During those, he had been performing a duty for which he had been paid, nothing more. Here, though, the task had a personal nature, beyond any he had ever confronted. Where in the palace? he demanded of Zail, as the duo worked their way to the hill. Where? Below it, actually. As for a precise location, that cannot be ascertained. There are forces in play, the likes of which I have never come across. Spells I cast that should work to delve deeper are twisted and turned, rendering them useless. If I get closer, perhaps that will change. They've got to be warned, Cantrell insisted. They have to know the dangers right below them. At the base of the ancient steps, the necromancer forced his companion to halt. Captain Dumont, have you noticed anything amiss in the palace so far? Only that some of my men haven't returned. But neither Lord Khan nor his daughter seems at all at risk. The soldier did not like the way Zail spoke. What of that? You have fought in many battles, in many wars. Do you announce to the enemy your intentions? Or do you instead try to trick him, to leave him unsuspecting? Kentro's eyes narrowed. Are you trying to tell me we should say nothing to them? Not until we at least discover more, or until we sense some danger to them. And what do you suggest, necromancer? Zail glanced around, making certain that no one stood near enough to hear. We find out what lies beneath first. A part of Kentrill thought Zail's suggestion foolish, that the right thing to do would be to alert Atana of Gregus Mazzi's return. Another part, though, feared that the corrupted sorcerer would also find out. Surely Mazzi watched Khan and his daughter closely to make certain that they did not know of his hidden presence. Alerted, he was most likely to strike and strike to destroy. But the odds were good that the villain also watched his old master's guests. If they simply went in hunt of him, he would surely lay traps designed to kill all. We won't tell them just yet, Cantrell finally agreed. But we'll need some sort of distraction that would capture his interest so much that he won't pay any mind to the others. He's got a point there, came Humbart's muffled voice. Zail tapped the pouch, then nodded agreement. They kept silent about their goals as they re-entered the palace some time later. Neither had yet thought up a manner by which the attention of the hidden spellcaster might be diverted, but both knew that they could not wait long. Surely Gregus Mazzi had some imminent mischief in mind. Thinking of that, Cantrell sought out Albord. He found a younger mercenary just preparing to set out with two others for the city, which fit in directly with the captain's plan. Pulling Albord aside, Cantrell whispered, Don't ask why, but I have orders for you. Although his body revealed no reaction to his commander's surprising words, the blond fighter's eyes let Cantrell know that Albord understood the seriousness. I, Captain? I need to cut short the man's celebrations for the time being. I want you three to go down and collect the others you find. I want everyone up here and accounted for. Anyone who can't be found, let me know. Above all else, don't split up, and don't let any of the locals know what you're up to. And if anyone offers to help you find someone missing, refuse that help. This at last brought some reaction. Just how serious is this, Captain? Kentrew recalled his own encounter when the city had been transformed into a nightmare straight out of hell. He had finally come to the conclusion that the two women had used some exotic potion that had not only weakened him, but also caused his horrific hallucinations. It had been said that some assassins used such potions on their nails, and that only a touch might be needed to affect the victim. Serious enough, beware especially of two women, one in gold 
and both far too eager for your company. As he sent Albord and the others off, Zail rejoined him. What did you tell him? Enough to be wary. It won't look out of the question that I would be checking up on my men, necromancer. Mercenaries have a tendency to wear out their welcome quickly in times of peace, and having them all called in will just seem like a simple honest precaution. Do we tell Master Tsin as well? Cantrill shrugged. I don't know. I do want to tell Gorst right away. Though, and he's near the sorcerer. They quickly hurried to the library, but found, to their mutual surprise, that it was empty. The table where the Vajerai had sat for so long still lay, all but hidden, under a clustered pile of books and scrolls, but Sin and the mountain of notes he had made had vanished. The captain noticed one more thing missing, Gorst. The giant might have simply followed Sin in order to keep track of him, but the considerable pile of parchment missing coupled with the difficulty the short spellcaster would have had to try to carry all of it, made it obvious that Zinn had commandeered Gorst into helping him with something. Barely had Kentrill and Zail turned back, when from down the corridor Atana appeared. She saw the two, and her expression, already bright, seemed to the fighter to positively glow. Kentrill, you've done it! You've done it! Utterly ignoring the necromancer, she threw her arms around the captain and kissed him passionately. Cantrell momentarily forgot the sinister danger below, as he accepted Atana's gratitude. That he knew not what she thanked him for, he did not care. Gradually, he became aware of a bemused Zail watching him from behind Lord Khan's daughter. At first annoyed by this intrusion, Cantrell finally recalled what he and his companion had been trying to accomplish. With gentle force, Cantrell pushed away Atana, reconciling himself with at least being able to gaze at her up close. And for what am I being thanked so well? As if you didn't know. She almost kissed him again, but noticed the reluctance. A playful smile spreading across her perfect features, she allowed Zail to join in the conversation. You might find this of interest too, sir. I suspect I might, my lady. Atana graciously accepted his courtesy. At this moment, she informed both, the Vajerai sorcerer Quoth Tsin has an audience with my father. Already? interrupted Kentrill. He had not thought Tsin would begin trying to persuade Lord Khan for some time yet. Surely the Vajerai's greed had much to do with this sudden development. Kentrill only hoped that by rushing in, old Tsin had not ruined everything. The good sorcerer had told father that he thinks in a day or two he can help remove Gregus's curse. It will take hours of preparation, and at least as much spell work, but he feels certain it will succeed. Her eyes widened in hope and anticipation. Cantrell prayed that Sin would not let Juris Khan down, if only for Atana's sake. I am pleased to hear that, but, and more important for some, the red-haired princess added, her gaze especially fixed on Captain Dumont now. Master Tsin has already accomplished one miracle. He has convinced father that Yure should be a part of the world again, that the quest for heaven is one we should undertake in the matter of any mortal, through the trials of life itself. Kentrell hesitated to respond, hoping he had correctly understood her. Juris Khan won't try to recast the spell? He won't try a second time to claim the sanctuary of heaven? No. Thanks to the Vigerai, father now believes that we've a role here. He thinks that we may be needed to help guide the rest of the world toward the proper path. Father even wonders now if this was meant to be from the beginning. It all sounded too fantastic to Captain Dumont, but in Atana's face he read only truth. Lord Khan had changed his mind. Tsin had actually succeeded, and far sooner than Kentrill could have ever imagined possible. My congratulations on this news, my lady, Zail politely said. Thank you, she replied, giving the necromancer a momentary smile before returning her full attention to Kentrill. Father is so thrilled. He would like to honor you and Master Tsin shortly with a private dinner. You too, if you wish, Master Zail. The pale figure shook his head. 
my kind are not known for their social behavior, and besides, I have really done nothing to deserve such recognition. However, I certainly agree that Captain Dumont and the sorcerer should be honored. As you wish. Atana seemed to forget the necromancer from there on. Kentrill, I hope you'll say yes. What else could he say? Of course, the honor's mine. Splendid. It's all settled then. A servant will be at your quarters before long to help you dress. Dress? The mercenary did not like the sound of that. Of course, interjected Zail innocently. One must always be properly attired for a state dinner, Captain. Before Kentrell could protest, Atana kissed him once more, then hurried away. Both men watched her alluring form swiftly vanish down the hall. A unique woman, Captain Dumont. Very much. The necromancer swept closer. This dinner could also be to our benefit. With Lord Khan and his daughter occupied with you and the Vigerai, I can try surreptitiously to investigate our likely route below. There must be some detailed outline of the palace's design, and possibly even mention of the caverns Khan hinted of even deep. Kentrell continued to eye the direction down which Atana had disappeared. I still don't like this. Remember that Gregus Matsi once desired Khan's daughter. He has not touched her so far, but if he realizes she has been alerted, he may decide to steal her away. Her ignorance is her safety. All right, the captain snapped. He glared at the tall, slim figure beside him. Just make certain you don't get caught. That would be hard to explain. If I am, I shall make it known to all that I acted on my own. She will have no reason to lose her trust in you, Captain. With a slight bow, Zael departed. Kentrell frowned, still not quite certain about this pact he had made with the necromancer, then headed to his quarters to see what could be done about making himself presentable for this no doubt elegant dinner. He would have rather been fighting a pitched battle. A crisp black dress uniform with gold ornamentation had been laid out on his bed, a uniform with long, sleek pants and a jacket with sharp tails. Epaulets decorated the jacket's shoulders, and a stylized image of a crown and sword had been sewn onto the left breast. The gleaming black leather boots rose knee-high, completing a rather dashing image. Cantrill felt foolish in the outfit. He was a soldier, a mercenary. The uniform should have been worn by a commander, a general, not someone of his lowly station. Still, he could not appear at a formal dinner with Lord Khan and Atana, dressed in his tired, oft-mended garments. That the uniform fit perfectly did not entirely surprise the captain. Atana would not have bothered to have set it aside for him if she had not known it would serve perfectly. He wondered whether it had once belonged to someone else, or if she had somehow simply conjured it up. Although he knew his way to the destination, Kentrell found two armed guards outside his door, waiting to escort him. With much ceremony, they marched down the halls with him, leading the fighter at last to where Khan waited. "'Welcome, my friend!' the fatherly figure called out from his chair. "'I am so pleased that you've agreed to join us!' Because of the robed monarch's inability to move, a heavy sculpted table had been brought in for the dinner. Decorated with filigree and lovingly carved by some expert hand, it likely cost as much as Kentrell made in ten years, if he was lucky. Atop it, a golden cloth had been set, and on top of that, gleaming plates, pristine silverware, and tall magnificent candelabras. Three chairs had been placed at the table, Juris Khan himself could not be moved off the dais, but a smaller, yet no less richly adorned table had been positioned near him. The larger table had been turned, so that the Lord of Yure sat at its head. Kuo Tsin already sat on what would have been the left of their host, but Kentrell saw no sign of Atana. However, as he appeared, she suddenly emerged from the side of the room, hand held out towards him. He stared unashamedly at her, both because he could not see how he had missed her entrance, and because nothing else in the richly decorated chamber could match the vision she presented. 
Her billowing emerald gown complemented her lush crimson tresses, which had been artfully draped down over her shoulders and breast. The sleeves stretched all the way to the back of her hands, and even fit the three lower fingers of each, almost like a partial glove. Other than her hair, her shoulders were bare, and the gown itself plunged just enough to entice, but not to flaunt her perfect form. He took the hand she offered and kissed the back. Atana then took his hand in hers and led him to the table. "'You shall sit there at the end,' she murmured. "'I shall be on your left, very near.' Kentrell almost went to his appointed place, then recalled how polished officers acted in the presence of ladies of the court. He steered her towards her own chair, then held it out for her. Smiling prettily, Atana accepted this gracious gesture. "'About time!' Tsin muttered as Kentrell seated himself. Judging by the empty goblet in front of him, the Vajerai had at least one cup of wine. He had come clad, of course, in the robes that he always wore. As a sorcerer, Tsin was not expected to dress in anything other than the garments of his calling, and in truth, the rune-inscribed robes did not seem out of place here. "'You look splendid!' Juris Khan informed the captain. "'Does he not look splendid, my dear?' Yes, father, Atana blushed. A wise and porteous choice, daughter. Truly, Captain Dumont, the uniform is appropriate for you. I thank you, my lord. Kentrell did not know what else to say. I am so gratified that both of you could come on such short notice. I owe each of you much already, and it appears I'll owe you much more before very long. We are honored, Lord Khan. Kov Tsin responded, raising his empty glass in salute. A liveried servant appeared from nowhere, and filled it from a dark green bottle, which perhaps had been what the Vajerai had desired all along. Kentrell nodded in appreciation of his host's words, although he did not feel as if he had done so much to deserve the praise. Yes, he had helped set the key to light in place, but any strong arm could have done so, more to the point, it would be Tsin who would release Yure's ruler from Gregus Matsi's curse. Captain Dumont could understand the sorcerer being given his due. But for himself, he felt grateful just to be able to sit near Atana. Snapping his fingers, Juris Khan had the first portion of their dinner brought out by several uniformed servants, so similar in appearance that Kentrell had to study each golden figure in turn in order to ascertain that they were not all identical. The servants treated him with as much honor as they did the master, which only further embarrassed him. He was a hired soldier, a man of rank, only because he had survived when many others, brave but poor men, had not. As the dinner went on, the veteran fighter feasted on fruits and vegetables, the likes of which he had never seen, and thick, well-cooked meats, dripping with their own juices. The wine he drank had such full flavor that Kentrell had to take care for fear he would imbibe too much. Everything he tasted had been made to perfection. The dinner seemed more a dream than a reality. Throughout it all, he also feasted on the glorious sight of Atana, so much so that it was not until late into the meal that the question that had bothered him earlier came into his mind. He stared at what little remained of the contents of his plate, finally asking with the utmost caution, my lord, where does all the food come from? Tsin glanced at him, as if having just heard an unruly child interrupt. Juris Khan, however, not only took his question in stride, but made it sound so very wise. Yes, well, you should ask. You wonder, no doubt, because I've indicated that although we were trapped between heaven and the mortal plane, we were aware of our fate. In some ways... Time did indeed pass, but in others it did not. Even I can't fully explain it, I'm sorry to say. We only knew that years went by in the true world, but we did not age. We did not much sleep, and most important, we did not hunger at all. Not at all? Kentrell uttered with some surprise. Well, perhaps we did, but only for our salvation. And... As we did not age, so too did our food not age. 
Thus we're still plentifully stocked, and shall be for some time. Atana's father smiled benevolently at both guests. And by then, I hope our situation will be already much improved. Cantrell nodded, grateful for the answer, but inwardly still embarrassed for having asked it in the first place. My lord, piped up the Vujerai, during the time you were explaining the obvious to our captain here, some further considerations formulated in my head. Khan found much interest in this. Considerations dealing with my condition? Aye, I will definitely have need of your daughter's abilities as well as your own. Just as I earlier proposed, you see? Hustin began a lengthy and, for the mundane captain, incomprehensible explanation. Cantrell gladly returned his attention to his hostess. Hatana noticed him, gazing at her again and smiled over the goblet she had just started raising to her lips. Eyes and mind on the heavenly view before him, Captain Dumont grew careless with the knife and fork he had been using. The blade slipped from the bit of meat he had been carving, and jabbed the side of the hand that had been holding the other utensil. Drops of blood splattered on the dish. Pain shot through Cantrell. The lavish, brightly lit chamber became a chamber of horrors instead. Blood, fresh blood, seemed to flow over tarnished, scratched walls, and the ceiling, which now existed only as a jagged hole, revealed a sky as turbulent and tortured as the rest of his surroundings. Crimson and black clouds did battle, monstrous bolts of lightning marking where they collided. Swirling maelstroms formed, seeming ready to swallow the bleeding world below. Bones that looked suspiciously human they scattered everywhere upon the stained and cracked floor, and something not a rat scurried over before disappearing into a small fissure running along the side of the room. A fierce wind coursed through, howling as it went. An intense heat that somehow still chilled Kentrill to his very soul swept along in its wake. Moans and cries suddenly assailed his ears. He rose at last from the rotting table, seeing on the broken dust-ridden plates before him, not the freshly cooked meal he had been eating, but instead a moldy, maggot-infested piece of greenish meat. The moans and cries continued to increase in intensity, so much so that the captain had to cover his ears. He stumbled back, falling against one wall, and only then finding the source of the mournful pleas. From each of the walls, hundreds of mouths began to cry out for help. Those nearest him seemed to scream the loudest. Pulling away in terror, Cantrell stumbled back to the table, and into, of all things, a very annoyed quoth Tsin. What do you think you're doing, Cretan? You're making a fool of yourself in front of our host. The Vajurai pointed in the direction of the dais. But when Cantrell looked there, he did not see the good and fatherly Juris Khan. The chair remained fixed in place, true, and of all things, it looked most untouched by the horrors around, but in it did not sit the Lord of Ure. Before Captain Dumont's fearful eyes arose, Kentrill, speak to me. It's Atana. Kentrill. And, as if it all had been a dream, the grand chamber immediately became whole and bright and alive once more. Atana held his bleeding hand tight, her eyes wide and concerned. Staring into those eyes gave the mercenary something on which to focus, to use as an anchor for his suddenly questionable sanity. Captain Dumont, are you unwell? With great reluctance, Cantrell looked to Juris Khan. He breathed a sigh of relief upon seeing the robed, masterful monarch standing tall. Absolute concern written over the elderly visage. Gone was the image of... of what? Cantrell could not even recall exactly what he had seen, only that it had been like nothing he had ever come across in all his life. The sheer act of trying to remember even the slightest image caused him to shiver. Khan's daughter brought a goblet to his mouth. Drink this, my darling. For her and her alone he drank it. The wine calmed him, pushed away all but the vestiges of his nightmare. Atana led him back to his chair, as he sat, Kentrell mumbled, I'm sorry, sorry, everyone. 
There is no need for one who is ill to apologize, Khan kindly remarked. One hand still on the captain's shoulder, Atana said, I think I know what happened, father. We walked in the garden earlier, and something bit him. I see, yes, the jungle insects sometimes make their way here, and some are said to carry disease that causes delusions and more. One must have bitten you, Captain Dumont. Having fought in many vile lands, where weather and wildlife made a more fearsome foe than the opposing soldiers, Cantrell could well believe their conclusions. Yet the monstrous clarity of his hallucination still stuck with the fighter. What within him could dredge up such horrors? As a man who had seen and shed blood, he had dreamt about the dark side of war, but never had his imagination created such a picture. Still, Atana's explanation would also give reason for his earlier episode in the city. Had that been the first sign of the sickness? He had assumed that Zorea or the other woman had drugged him, but such a drug should have worn off by now. Lord Khan seated himself again. Well, whatever the cause, I am sure that under my daughter's ministrations you will recover fine. I want you to be able to accept my gifts with full clarity of mind, so that I might not force you upon anything you do not wish. Gifts? Aye, good captain. Although if you accept, you'll be captain no more. The robed figure leaned towards his two guests. In the struggle against Gregus Mazzi, lives were lost, important ones, good ones, good friends. A vacuum thus exists in Ure, and if we are to become part of the mortal world again, that vacuum must be filled. You two can help in that. Kentrell felt Atana's fingers tighten on his shoulder, and when he looked up, she gave him an expression of pride and pleasure. Master Tsin, you and I have already discussed this in part, so you have some advantage over Captain Dumont. Nevertheless, the decision is no less a significant one for you, and so I state my offer again, with more consciousness this time. All those who wielded and governed the magic arts of my kingdom have perished, save my daughter and myself. I ask of you if you will bring honor again to that which Gregus Massey tainted. I ask you to take up the mantle of royal sorcerer, the magical knowledge of my realm, yours if you will ever sit at my left hand. The Vajerai rose slowly, a satisfied smile across his wrinkled countenance. Kentrell could only imagine the spellcaster's pleasure. He had more than gained long-term access to the books and scrolls of the library. For all practical purposes, Juris Khan had given the diminutive figure everything the Vigerai could have wanted. My lord Khan, Quovitsin graciously replied, nothing would please me more. I am gratified. Now the stately monarch turned toward Kentrell, who felt his stomach tie knots. Captain Kentrell Dumont, through your efforts to help us and the recommendations of one who has come to know you better than I, I've learned of a man of ability, determination, honor, and loyalty. I can think of no better qualities in a soldier, nay, in a leader. Khan stippled his fingers. We are an old realm in a new world, one you know much better. There's such a need for a man like you to guide us, to protect us from elements that may desire our downfall in this different time. I need you as a commander of my warriors, a protector of my people, a general, as that uniform calls for. Despite his recent spell, Kendrill pushed himself back to his feet. My gracious Lord Khan! But his host politely cut him off. And in you, eh? You should know that such a rank comes hand in hand with a title. The commander of our defenders is not only a soldier, but a prince of this land as well. He left the captain momentarily speechless. Atana, her hand now at his arm, squeezed tightly. And, as a member of the nobility, all rights therein are yours. You will be granted an estate, be able to raise servants of your own. Marry other members of nobility. At the last, 
Atana's hand squeezed particularly tightly. When Kentrill briefly let his gaze fly to her, he saw the answer for why Juris Khan would especially offer him this wondrous posting. Despite their liaison so far, the soldier had always known inside that he truly had no hope for a lasting love. Atana was a princess, born and raised to marry someone equal to her or higher than her lofty station. Kings, sultans, emperors, and princes could have easily asked for her hand, but not a lowly officer. Now her father had eradicated that one impediment with a single gesture. And so forth, finished Juris Khan. He smiled as a father would smile on his son, perhaps a foreshadowing of events. What say you, good captain? What could Kentrell say? Only a fool or a madman could refuse, and despite his recent episodes, he did not feel either of those. I... I am honored to accept, my lord. Then, all that I've offered is most definitely yours. You and Master Tsin have made me very happy. Master Tsin assures me of complete success in freeing me, and if that holds true, three days hence... As marked by the sun seen beyond our borders, I shall before the entire court officially acknowledge your new stations. Khan nearly fell back into his chair, as if both physically and emotionally exhausted by his grand gesture. You've the gratitude of all Yure, but the gratitude of my humble self at the most. Atana returned to her seat, and she blushed even more whenever her eyes and Kentrils met. The talk began to turn again to Kuof Tsin's plan to free Lord Khan from the chair, eventually even drawing Atana in because of her necessary role. Left alone now, Captain Dumont turned to his own thoughts. And those thoughts concerned his subterfuge. Even after all Juris Khan had granted him, after all Atana had promised him with her eyes and lips, he had said nothing concerning the possibility that Gregor Smati still lived, and might yet turn his black hearts again on them. At this moment, Kentrill knew, Zail crept about the palace, seeking behind the backs of their hosts the plans of its design. True, the pair had only the best of intentions in mind, but still the captain felt, as if each second he failed to speak, he betrayed Atana and her father further. Despite his regrets, though, Kentrill chose to say nothing. If Zail proved to be wrong, no harm would be done. Yet if the necromancer had divined correctly, there would be only him and Kentrill to deal with the threat. Khan could do nothing while so impaired, and not for a moment would Captain Dumont even consider letting Atana face the corrupted spellcaster. Tsin already had too much with which to deal. No, if Gregor Smatsi did indeed live, Kentrill would have to see it himself that the corrupted sorcerer paid the ultimate price for his past crimes. Atana caught his gaze once more. She smiled and blushed, completely ignorant of the darkening thoughts behind the captain's own smile. No, no matter what happened, Gregor Smatsi could not be allowed ever to touch her, not even if it cost Kentrill Dumont his own life in the process.